You see my graph there? I can see it. Can everybody else see it? Ashwini, do you see a graph? Yes. Okay. I see it. I muted myself. I think everybody should mute themselves because it'll make it easier. Yeah. It's going to control that. Great. Okay. Well, welcome to our, this is going to be our third global Grand Rounds. And we're pleased today to welcome participants from around the tri-state area. Uh, I'm can just start with a very brief update of what we have going on now at, uh, at Mount Sinai. And as you can see from this slide, the curve really does appear to have flattened. Uh, we were uh, at about 2000 or more hospitalized patients every day for uh, a period from about the 5th of April to the 15th of April. And this has started to drop off. Uh, there is a definite trend with uh, every Monday, the cases coming back up. So I, it appears that there's a little bit of a break on the weekends, uh, but the, the trend for decreasing is, is definitely there. So that's the good news. Uh, but it's, you know, this is good news in relative terms. Uh, as of yesterday, we still had 1,500 cases admitted uh, at the Mount Sinai Health System, almost 400 in intensive care units. And as you know, the care of these patients is enormous, so that's a huge burden. 124 uh, patients under investigation. We, at this point, have transferred 163 patients to the Samaritan Purse Field Hospital in Central Park and another 130 COVID positive patients to the Javits Center. Uh, we have successfully discharged to home 3,273 uh, 3, patients, and that really is the good news. Um, and this is heavily balanced by the more than 1,200 deaths in our health system. Uh, neurosurgery remains a very vital service. This is the this is the discharge data that I get every single day. Uh, this is just Mount Sinai Hospital. Um, and I will point out that even though our discharges from Mount Sinai Hospital are down, the Mount Sinai Neurosurgery Department remains the largest subspecialty group in the hospital, uh, exceeded only by the entire general surgery service. So, uh, you know, the, the, the work, the burden, and the intensity of activity continues. Uh, it's something I'm very proud of, and I know that uh, all of you are working very, very hard to keep this going. So with that, I will turn to an intro to Shirag. Uh, Shirag was recently our visiting professor, so those of you uh, here know him well. Uh, he is now professor and chairman uh, in the, the Department of Neurosurgery at New York Medical College, Director of the Brain and Spine Institute, Section Chief of Neurovascular Surgery, Program Director, Fellowship Director. So it looks almost like a one-man department, but I know that there are other faculty there as, as well. Uh, and we're gonna hear from some of his outstanding people. Um, Shirag was educated at Columbia University. Um, he obtained a master's in genetics from BU. Uh, trained at, when it was there, UMDMJ, that was the name. Uh, and then he was a star resident in the Mount Sinai Residency Program. Uh, he did diagnostic and endovascular fellowships. Um, and as we heard when he was with us uh, recently, has really contributed to explosive growth of his program. Uh, Gita, his wife, uh, is an internist at the Bronx VA. They have superstar twins, probably wouldn't surprise anyone to know that. Uh, they're athletes and musicians, um, including, you know, very, very high performance, as you can see here, uh, and uh, still a very athletic and energetic family. 
So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Sharag. It's a pleasure to have you host this week's International Grand Rounds and look forward to hear what you have to say. We're having some technical difficulty getting Sharag's video and uh, audio activated. Um, so I think we should move uh, directly on to Ashwini for the moment. And when Sharag comes back on in a minute, we're able to work this out. Um, then we can have him uh, speak and, and introduce Ashwini after he started his presentation. So sorry about that. No worries. We're, we're working that out right now. Okay, so can I take the share screen? Yes, go ahead. Okay, I'll do that. Okay, so I think I'm on presenter view. Is everybody seeing the present the slide, first slide? Yes. Okay, uh, well, well thank you. you're on you're on presenter view, but it's showing the presenter view rather than the screen rather than the slide itself. Oh, let me uh, try slideshow. Okay, now I'm on slideshow. Yeah, that's that's perfect. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much. Thank you, Josh. Uh, thank you, Chirag. It's a it's it's a pleasure being here. Um, anything that takes me away from a telehealth visit uh, one morning <laughs> is is really a, a pleasure. Just to share with you, you know, in my own group, um, I was on call, you know, three weeks ago. So maybe on the onset of when Philadelphia was starting to get affected, and that week we had four trauma patients, and it was already after we went into lockdown. And uh, I can't tell everybody on this call and everybody knows this, that uh, how much fun it was and how much of a pleasure it was to operate. Um, and, and you don't know what you have un until you don't. Um, so as a philosophical, and I'll give a few philosophical points uh, during this talk. And uh, I wanna give credit that one of my chief residents, Tana Theofanis, and we'll talk about her a little bit later. Um, she helped us with this presentation. In fact, she gave grand rounds on this topic. and. Uh, I think Raj uh, emailed me. We also compiled our experience and submitted for an editorial ex uh, review. So I think a lot of people know the message to Garcia, but I'm gonna share it again uh, for anybody on this call who doesn't know it. And I was first introduced to a message to Garcia when John Jane gave grand rounds uh, at Jefferson um, and God bless him. Um, and, and he actually had a lot of mission driven um, principles and it really stuck with me and it's become a bigger part of me as time has gone by. And the story briefly is that uh, in the 1800s or late 1800s when the US was fighting Spain, um, there was a pivotal uh, battle where we needed to get in touch with the General Garcia from the other side and nobody knew where General Garcia was. And um, so the president approached uh, his troops and said, how do we find this man? And they found uh, a small a surge, uh, cadet or a sergeant at that time, Rowan. And he said, look, I need to get this message to Garcia. And so the story goes that he strapped it on his heart. Um, he ran through the woods, the forest, he crossed oceans, and he found uh, the General Garcia and uh, helped create that partnership with eventually had a lot of success. And the whole message here um, that stuck with everybody is Rowan never asked, how do I find him? What do I do? What are the steps? The mission was just to find Garcia. And he took it on him that he had to just get the job done. And, and it's an interesting, it's a real interesting story because I think each and every one of us, when we entered neurosurgery, and I tried to do something like this once a month with my residents where we talk about our mission, we talk about our goals and, and what are those things that align all of us together in our program. So it's become part of a cultural thing. And of course, in this era, we're doing it a little bit more often. So in our program, we emphasize that neurosurgery is a duty and neurosurgery is a calling. And our slogan is, why do we do neurosurgery? We do neurosurgery because it's hard. So that, that's the mantra that we repeat over and over again, um, because I think it drives us all together. It's one of those things that if groups of people are chanting together, they work together, they, they realize who each other are, they learn to trust each other, and it's all built on that. And right now we're fighting a fire. I know our, our president calls it a, a battle or a war. Um, I look at us a little bit like firemen. Um, I don't necessarily look at us only as soldiers. We're people who risk our lives. I mean, I'm sorry, we're people who save people's lives. Well, the only difference between us and firemen is the firemen also risk their own lives, which fortunately we tend not to do. 
but we get up in the middle of the night to save people from strokes, hemorrhages, spinal cord injury, right? We, we're there when people need us. So to be able to do that work, it's like what firemen and soldiers do. There's an extensive amount of training that is necessary. And that's why I put that quote up there, train as if your life depends on it, because it does. It is the service that people value most in us. And the second thing I want to share is this article uh, that was in a couple of weeks ago in the New York Times by David Brooks. And it says the age of coddling is over. And his, his taglines, which I'm gonna read to you is, um, you know, learning what leadership, what hardship has to teach us, obviously in the setting of, of COVID-19 right now. And he says, I'm also reminded of the maxim that excellence is not an action, it's a habit. Tenacity is not a spontaneous flowing of good character is doing what you were trained to do. It manifests in those we trained, spared them hardship, but in those whose training embraced hardship and taught students to deal with it. And the few things I wanna emphasize here for us to feel good about ourselves, I calculated that as residents, we, you train over 20,000 hours before you graduate. If you work 80 hours a week only, and you have your vacation time and some research time, you will have put in about 23,000 hours of training during your seven years of residency. According to the book by Gladwell, you have skills to be perfect, you know, to be savants at two separate types of specialties. The, that is neurosurgery. But the interesting other part, which is where I'm going with this, uh, the age of coddling is over, is that there's a shadow education that you have to be aware of in residency because it's much more complicated than just doing neurosurgery or performing neurosurgery. This point about the character and leadership development, it's actually the penultimate. It's actually the hardest part of what we do because people look at us as their leaders. People look at us to set examples. People look at us to be good communicators. People look at us not to have anger breakdowns. People look at us to have innovation and people look at us you know, to, to guide them to the future. There is a lot of anxiety and I'll talk about it around uh, this COVID era among other specialties. And the question is how do we provide that leadership? So a part of what I'm gonna discuss today is not only what our residents are doing, but how this all molds together uh, as one. And I'll cover the residents role, our little story with PPEs, which hopefully you didn't have, um, our didactics education, our team morale, which I've been alluding to, uh, and, and our search planning. So everybody knows that COVID hit in January and the pandemic started in March. And at Jefferson, uh, March 13th was our date in which we said that uh, we're gonna stop elective surgery. And since that date, obviously we've had patients who've had ruptured aneurysms who are COVID positives, AVM ruptures, ICHs, uh, trauma, strokes, uh, interestingly enough, the stroke uh, numbers uh, tend to be a little bit higher. And we went on a very immediate testing protocol because we actually didn't stop all surgery. Although we started curtailing elective surgery on March 13th, I think it took us two weeks to come to a near stand still and figure out how that was because people didn't take it as seriously. We weren't sure how serious this problem was in March. And I'll come back to that a little bit later. So... At that time, right, uh, this, this publication came out the week after by Atul Gawande, you know, about how Singapore and Hong Kong and, and South Korea, they jumped on this whole problem early. Um, they figured out when to use masks, when to do social distancing, when to use the N95s, and they really contained it. And it took us a while. And, and why I tell you that is when this problem started, we started having a lot of work groups and meetings, getting ready for the surge and how to plan for it. And, and in our hospital, we took on a few principles and we said that we're not going to deploy neurosurgeons. We're going to try to keep people in their scope of their practice, try to use the best people to do the best job that they can offer. And so in that, when it came to ICU care, which we felt that we probably could offer, since our residents all have basically critical care training, we segregated the ICU job and management. So medical doctors, intensivists were responsible for management. Um, what we added to that was we were part of the central line team. Like our guys being technical experts could probably put lines in minutes. Um, and that's what we do when we're NS1s. 
So Donald Yee, who's one of my chief residents on the upper uh, left, I think on your screen, um, he started working with general surgery. We created work groups and said that how we would actually have a team who would wear paper masks and go into people's rooms, how somebody could be doing a central line and a line, um, you know, after the patient had been intubated by anesthesia and their teams. So we created teams uh, to best service the different groups of patients. So we created these plans to really work together. Um, the good part of this story is that uh, in Philadelphia, we have not hit surge planning, uh, which probably is so different from your experience at New York. Uh, honestly, your numbers are probably, uh, at least compared to our hospital system, uh, six times higher. We also really early established what the role of our neurosurgery residents were gonna be. And we talked about where our areas for exposure were. And so we immediately went on to a call schedule where we were basically, whatever we do to night float to manage the service, we did the same thing and we created a day float system. So we got as many people out of the hospital, we got our clinical practice practitioner people, nurse practitioners out of the hospital and to maintain basically a skeleton crew. Fortunately, with elective surgery going down, the numbers every day, the census dropped and became easier to care for the patients and there wasn't so much discharge because there's an onerous amount of work with discharge planning. The other place that we identified this risk was in the ER and we had some very nice conversations with the ER and said, listen, we are not coming down for transverse process fractures. We will look at your CAT scans. If somebody has straight subarachnoid hemorrhage, we'll arrange the follow-up. Um, we had a lot of agreement and alignment that we'll have communication and we'll make sure those patients get follow-up. And, and so there were a lot of little disease states that we, we sectioned out. Um, and so this concept of us doing triage and communicating with everybody was a real thing. During this time, we also started having a lot of discussions with our residents about the anxiety that was being felt in the hospital, because clearly the ER doctors were having a lot of exposure uh, because anybody with a cough or cold or fever was walking in. Um, the medical services started increasing in their admission numbers. If you go into the medical or surgical ICU, every nurse 12 hours a day is wearing a paper, donning and doffing uh, their masks. And so you can imagine that everybody who goes into that unit who doesn't have that grit is going to be a little bit uh, more adversely affected, I think, uh, you know, by the, by the situation. And it was important for us to understand that, like even psychiatry, uh, for example, said that if there's an ER admission for, uh, for suicide behavior or depression, they were allowed to use the robot and go into a patient's room in the ER. And, and so we adapted our system to do that. So I, I think that part of the discussion uh, was quite good. Um, I already talked about the call coverage. I'm going to tell you the PAPR story. So on March 17th, the institution actually made all of us get fitted, you know, for the right mask uh, and the right PAPR just to make sure that we understood how to do that. What I'm going to tell you about that time is at that date, like I told you, it took us two weeks to really get more serious about the whole thing. And uh, it turns out we find out later that all the nurses, you know, they got PAPRs anesthesia got PAPRs. We as a department didn't get all of ourselves PAPRs. Now, I'd say that we were fitted, but we didn't actually commandeer the unit to take care of us. And then we started taking care of stroke patients. And I'm going to, I don't know if this video will play on the internet, but I'll try it. It's a TikTok video from my vascular <laughs> guy. No, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> So uh, Pascal Jabor uh, is our one of our endovascular guys. I'm, I'm sure Chirag knows him. Um, he started taking care of a lot of patients who had, um, you know, COVID positive uh, results. And uh, you know, I think so, they're preparing a manuscript with uh, somebody in New York City that the numbers are historically higher than they've been. And uh, he isolated himself for his family. Fortunately, Pascal has not been sick, no fever, no cough, and taking all the precautions. But even in our INR suite, we only had uh, three PAPRs allocated to it. Um, Tana, you know, who did a lot of the slides for this presentation, um, who's there, it started hitting us when we started putting ventriculostomies in on, on the floor and, and the numbers started getting higher and you didn't know because rapid testing wasn't even available if the patient was positive or not. And by that time in the first week of April, when we went back to the institution, we said, listen, 
our neurosurgery residents need protection. <laughs> okay, I'm not trying to play that again. Um, and it was a problem because at that point in our healthcare system, we had run out of PAPRs. And so there was a gentleman uh, applied, you know, who was making these decisions for us as a healthcare system, who would get allocated what? In the beginning, people were so good about aggressively taking it. Our point was that we're coming in the middle of the night to do an emergency craniotomy. We're doing a hemicraniectomy. We're doing a ventriculostomy. What do we do? We don't have the luxury of waiting 15 minutes after an intubation for the droplets to settle. We're doing uh, procedures simultaneously. We're doing emergency surgery. So we actually had to create a very uh, cogent uh, discussion. And it, then they released three papers for our residents, which they're using now. You know, there was two assigned, uh, we covered in our residency, two main hospital buildings. Um, but it took us a little while to get that level of protection uh, as being advocates to ourselves. And hopefully you guys were all ahead on the curve. So those were our two challenges um, that we've actually faced in this era is one is creating our central line management team. And then two, um, this is, you know, our faculty all gowning and, and working together to take care of patients. And these are our residents doing hemicraniectomy and uh, bedside ventriculostomy. So, so the reality has been there for the residents too, uh, as well as the staff that, you know, we have to do what we have to do. So now I'm going to talk. Anyway, I just want to tell you you have a three minute, three minutes left. Oh, thanks. Okay, I'm good. So I'm going to just share with you really quickly uh, what we're doing. And in, in our residency, we call this now knowledge sharing and micro learning, um, because I think people have gotten used to learning things in one to two minutes uh, there. So Jefferson went as a platform and its rollout date was actually March uh, 15th also. We went from Blackboard to this thing called Canvas where you have access to a lot of knowledge and tools. And we were the first people now as a department to roll out Canvas. So since we went to the skeleton crew, we also created a lot of work groups to create a lot of these learning healthcare systems. And so we modified this platform now first to be a platform for our surgical nuances you know, we have six faculty who do spine surgery. We have four faculty to who do endovascular and everybody has their nuances. So on this platform, we actually have running spreadsheets. We have blogs. The faculty now can go in and they can, um, they can put a running conversation. People can put likes if the comment is good and this is how people do it. So it's been an opportunity to freely share neurosurgical knowledge. We put our journal clubs, grand rounds. Um, we live, have some storage limitations. But uh, we have a centralized knowledge platform. I suspect that everybody around the country is doing Zoom types education. Our education conferences have never been so well attended. Um, at any one conference, we have uh, faculty, we have almost every resident, we have the chairman coming to the faculty, uh, we have weekly journal clubs. So this part has been of record uh, proportion. Um, we're getting prepared now for the May 15th exam. I think a lot of people were disappointed after studying so hard. Uh, and then now being pushed back two months. So we're part of that. We're participating in the CNS uh, virtual uh, grand rounds, which has been excellent. So you have access to people from all around the country and world. And then talk briefly about team morale. So our, uh, as a chairman and program director, I'm program director, we meet with the residents every Monday and Friday. We do Monday to give them the weekend update and Friday to give them the weekly update. And so they can bring up their concerns like when we spoke about the PAPR. Um, it's been an adaption for each and every one of them to get to this new world and, and how to deal with it, how to manage their learning and how to figure out how to have that surgical training. And um, I, I say this to the residents on, on the line that you know the silver lining here is that you, we, this is the first time that we have some time in our life to take stock and agency uh, because the residency is where you have your greatest opportunity, not only to form that surgical skill set, but to go back and think about what leadership means and what the shadow education, to understand social healthcare needs, to understand innovation, to understand research. Our residents have put out their uh, first newsletter. Uh, we're planning to do this twice a year so that we can stay connected to all our old graduates uh, around the country. Um, we've adapted our website, you know, by adding profiles. We've had a horrible website because our institution is, uh, is uh, 1980s about it, but they've allowed us to have better access. So we're taking that initiative on our own. Um, I, you know, we're actually participating in the online grand rounds that the CNS does. 
Um, they have a lot of these special symposiums uh, that are going on and they're gonna do a town hall. It'll be interesting to see if you have a few hundred people from around the country going on to that. So in conclusion, I, I think we were, um, as physicians going back to the mission, we took a oath to respect and take care of our patients. Um, we have a skill set, like even when it came to central lines, we knew we could do it faster than anybody else. We offer our help to anybody in the hospital that needs it. Um, we really have hyper prioritized our safety and well being for our residents and, and through communication. And, and we talk about how our residents should be leaders in the hospital. You know, we're used to living in the hospital. We know the hospital. We know everybody around us. We know that if we have anxiety, people have 10x of that. So, and the final point is, uh, you know, it was uh, our lesson learned here was also that we didn't take this pandemic as serious on day one um, because we were a little bravado about the safety, but then we caught up uh, thanks to the, the voice uh, of our own residents and the ability that we had to communicate with them as program director and chairman. So um, finally, um, thank you, New York City, for your resilience. You know, I grew up in the Bronx. Um, I'm very proud of having New York in my blood. Um, it's a character that it has um, where it knows it can survive, having gone through a disaster two decades ago and experiencing another one. So it gives me inspiration to know that you guys are, are pushing and doing well as well. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Sharan. Um, you know, that was, that was fantastic. You brought up a, a lot of good points that I'm hoping that we have some time at the end uh, to talk about, especially on sort of the, the durable lessons that you've learned that you think are going to stick with us for resident education. Uh, but, you know, before we get to that, I just want to take a step back. I apologize for some of the technical issues I was having on my end. Uh, like many things, uh, my, one of my residents bailed me out of it here. Uh, so I'm uh, thankful, thankful to all of them as I am every day. Uh, but I also want to, uh, you know, I'm told that Dr. Bederson gave a very gracious introduction, and I'm sorry to have missed that. Uh, so, you know, with that, I want, I know we have a lot to cover today uh, in our con con continuing conversations on COVID-19. And so this unique forum that I know Dr. Bederson had initiated of the Chair's Corner, I wanted to just take one or two minutes to backtrack a little bit and share at least a couple of thoughts, but I will keep it very, very brief. You know, so over the last few weeks, we really have all been focused really on the mitigation of this unprecedented crisis. Uh, the discussions that we've had on this forum over the last month or so, for me, have been invaluable in strategizing for my department and my institution. And frankly, if we think back to just a month ago, I, I think um, Dr. Sharon started to touch on that. Uh, you realize what limited processes all our institutions had in place uh, and all our practices had in place. So frankly, in a very, very short period of time, we have come an extremely long way. Now, um, in spite of all of this tragedy, I do think the experience has brought us many opportunities that we need to continue to explore. Uh, opportunities and collaboration. This WebEx that we've uh, initiated, I think is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, education, um, virtual care, just to name a few. And, you know, as we really start to stabilize these acute events, well, you know, I think all of us have realized that we need to collectively focus in a very determined way to repair some of the damage that's been done to us. And that's really damage to our practices, damage to our profession, uh, to our healthcare systems, and overall our damage to the ability to deliver good, high quality neurosurgical care. So the fact is, I, I don't think things are going to be the same again. And so, at least not for a very, very long period of time. But that doesn't mean that, you know, the rebuild that we put together here can't, in fact, in certain ways, perhaps be better. So uh, what I'd like to focus on uh, in the next 90 minutes, and Dr. Sharon did a great job starting out on that, is really how do we get back to daily practice? Uh, how do we get back to our academic community? And then how do we get back to this educational mission uh, that all of us uh, on this teleconference are committed to? And then equally importantly, perhaps, how do we learn from this and what are the durable lessons? Uh, so, you know, I, I apologize for missing the introductions, but, uh, you know, for today's panel, we have a couple of really great speakers. Dr. Uh, uh, Ashwini Sharan, who you heard from already, is a professor uh, and program director at Thomas Jefferson. Uh, and then we also have Dr. Neil Nanda, who's the system chair of, of the Barnabas Rutgers Health System. And Dr. Nanda is going to speak to us about organized neurosurgery after COVID-19. 
Uh, for the next few minutes, though, what I was hoping to do is share some of the more operational concerns that I think all of us will um, have as we start to re uh, as we work to restart our practice. Uh, hopefully, you guys can see my screen. Chris, looks okay? Yep, perfect. Okay, perfect. All right, so uh, New York uh, clearly has been the ac epidemic center, uh, but you can th see throughout the entire Northeast corridor, uh, certainly are where the concentration of diagnosed cases and mortality lies within the United States. Um, that of course, is un it's unclear what portends for the next few weeks in the rest of the country. Uh, as certain states do start to open up early. Now in New York, fortunately over the last four or five days, um, we have started to see some plateauing and now a slow downward trend in new cases as well as mortality. So this is very encouraging and I think very timely for the discussion that we're having. Now there's a, a lot of words here, but you know I started to summarize this and felt that I really couldn't do it better than this editorial by Dr. Carter and Dr. Chioka, I think we have to step back and just look at the last, ten, uh, the early part of March and the processes that Dr. Sharon and others will describe today. Uh, what we did at each of our institutions, we ceased all physical meetings, we virtualized all non-essential outpatient visits, stopped performing elective surgery, automa uh, automated and implemented remote work for residents and staff, restricted every single visitor to our facility, uh, required every employee to get properly uh, fitted with PPEs, uh, shuttered all, all of our labs, converted all of our neurosurgical beds uh, to isolated COVID-19 uh, beds, deploy redeployed significant amount of our residents, uh, faculty, and staff. Uh, Cross-privileging uh, across um, hospitals was rapidly developed and certainly new triage processes that we've spoken about in this forum. Now, and when you look at that long, arduous list, what you realize is in order for us to get back to normal, much of this is going to need to be reversed or at the very least fine tuned. Now, this curve, um, which I, I pulled from University of Washington's uh, big data site, uh, demonstrates and then projects uh, New York specifically and overall mortality. And I think that matches very nicely with what our expectations for our neurosurgical practice was. As with many th things in this pandemic, I don't think we realize the severity of it um, early enough. And I think we all kind of assume that our, as our lives in many aspects would bounce back very quickly. So this blue curve is really meant to demonstrate, I think how we assumed our neurosurgical practices would bounce back. That as the mortalities came down, that things would perhaps not as quickly as they disappeared, but things would reappear and put themselves into place and we'd be back at a plateau in a re relatively reasonable amount of time. I think though the reality looks more like this, that when we are allowed to reopen, it's going to be really a series of small climbs, plateaus, and then different, and then new climbs. And each of these climbs are going to be hurdles that we're going to, perhaps unexpected, that we're going to encounter that we're going to have to challenge ourselves with. So obviously the relaxation of this shelter in place is gonna be the key first component, but we have to realize that the timing here uh, of each of these plateaus is gonna be reasonable, regional, it's gonna be variable. And when our reality actually meets our expectation in terms of return to practice, I think is quite unclear uh, based on some of the things I'm gonna share with you. So considerations for our return to practice. Uh, five things I want to kind of concentrate on quickly, regional regulations and hospital specific capacity, current and institutional COVID testing ability and protocols, case prioritization and scheduling, new perioperative challenges that we're going to face in our outpatient practice, and then not to underestimate the psychological state of our patients. So <clears throat> ideal timing for restarting elective surgery. At the minimum standard, certainly sustained reduction in new COVID cases for a period of 14 days, I think is the timeline that most government institutions that we're dealing with are working on. And so again, if you look at the New York timeline, uh, New York case volumes trending downwards, certainly in our region for the moment, 
barring any unforeseen circumstances, we really are targeting somewhere around mid-May 2020, give or take a week. Now, that's less than three, four weeks away. And I think in that period of time, we have a lot of planning to do. Uh, we need to make sure that our facilities are safe to be able to treat all patients requiring hospitalization without re uh, resorting to this crisis level standard of care that we've all kind of uh, fallen back on over the last couple of uh, weeks. Uh, certainly, I think, you know, at our institution and, and probably all others that have been in the center of this pandemic, the uh, our staff is, is stretched, our resources are stretched, and we certainly are not operating at full efficiency. Obviously, we need to make sure that the number of beds and everything else that goes with taking care of patients and specifically new elective patients is in place and available. And we need to make sure that the available number of trained and educated staff is appropriate for the cases that we have planned. And this last piece I'll talk about in just a second. Now, we've all heard in the lay press almost on a daily, if not hourly basis, this idea of testing. So what's the current state of testing? We need to make sure reliably for inpatients, outpatients, and healthcare professionals that obviously testing is in place, uh, accurate and easily available. So at our institution, we've moved to this multi-tiered risk stratified model that's important that we've used as a way to sort of balance current maximum availability of tests as well as the various clinical scenarios that each of us encounter in a daily basis. So <clears throat> these two parts really consist of in-house PCR testing. We rapidly had put together this eight hour uh, standardized testing that many of us uh, still utilize regionally. Uh, and this is now being used for more non-urgent inpatient testing. This was actually in place in our hospital before a lot of the larger labs were able to provide us um, excess capabilities. And then this was backed up by a more newly available two hour rapid testing that really has changed how we're doing things. Uh, we use this now for all admissions into the hospital and we've already started to use it now on over 150 um, outpatient uh, urgent cases that are all receiving this two hour PCR before, uh, going, uh, before going to the operating room. So what this offers us is really near real time awareness of patients COVID status, certainly better protection for the care delivery teams that uh, are in our hospital. But it also offers us this ability to return to this green zones idea that we had discussed in an earlier forum, more at a hospital level, but we've created these mini green zones um, in the OR, in radiology, in, the, in our ICUs, and frankly, in our hospital. Uh, this picture on the right shows uh, our new, what was supposed to be our new ambulatory tower that was converted very rapidly into a 40 bed mixed non-COVID ICU. And the main tower that you see in the back is now largely still very much filled with COVID patients, including our entire 17 bed neurosurgery ICU. But using that rapid test, we can now triage these patients into really segregated uh, areas of the hospital. But to really apply this broadly, uh, this drive-through screening process we have in place has been really invaluable. First, it offers now voluntary screening for all healthcare professionals. So that usually has about a 48 hour turnaround and certainly for symptomatic healthcare professionals as well. And then four day testing um, for all outpatients that under, need to undergo urgent surgery. So this has now been built into our pre-op outpatient planning for these patients and certainly this last piece is what's gonna be very important as we transition into elective practice. We're gonna need some consistent daily way to screen uh, patients if we're to operate on them safely and co-localize them safely. And then you certainly need to understand your institution's capabilities as you're planning for elective surgery. You need to understand how many tests your institution at the very least can do every day. We're up to about a thousand a day within our health network and we've used that data actually now to start creating, you know, these are nice heat maps of each of our sites. I'm just sharing with you two out of our eight hospitals, but it gives us a very clear idea of the regions that we're capturing and testing effectively from. And then conversely, where the gaps may also be for both positive and negative COVID testing. So it, it's been, this is again, the tip of the iceberg in terms of the testing piece for us, but uh, new data points that are important. So the unanswered questions in terms of time intervals for new testing coming up. Uh, antibody testing, I think everyone agrees that this is 
really going to start to change how we understand this disease and how we approach uh, healthcare uh, workers uh, returning to work. Um, asymptomatic cases, certainly a lot larger than probably any of us realize. But antibody testing, at the very least, is at least some weeks away. Uh, here and other institutions, I suspect at Sinai and perhaps Jefferson as well, antibody testing is or has been put into place already and is being validated. But there definitely are issues with the validity of these tests, depending on what their source of origin is. Potential therapies, which at best, again, are months out. Convalescent plasma and IL-6 inhib uh, inhibition trials that we're undertaking here. Uh, and then other uh, uh, medications such as remdesivir, uh, certainly all in trial phase. They might serve as a bridge for those that are symptomatic and may eventually be curative, but certainly no consistent data uh, as of yet. And then the vaccine, um, which clearly is going to be the defining factor in how we move forward. Uh, questions remain. Are phase one and three, one to three going to be fast-tracked? And then does vaccination and infection build long-term immunity? This is still unclear based on some reports, certainly out of Korea, that many patients have now tested positive a second time. But an effective vaccine is really the endpoint as where when we probably are going to learn or get close to some normalcy. Now, just switch gears now to case prioritization. <clears throat> All of us, I think, have been really using something similar to this to triage urgent and emergency cases. Uh, this is out of neurosurgery just a, a couple of weeks ago. But I think uh, as neurosurgeons, we all recognize the cases pretty consistently that fall into these two categories. <clears throat> the bigger challenge as we move into elective volume is really going to be uh, how to develop more objective metrics for triage. Uh, this is just one of the proposals. This is from the American College of Surgeons uh, that's developed this MENT scoring system, uh, which is based on a triad of looking at the procedure, severity of the procedure, severity of the disease, and then patient morbidity on a preoperative morbidity factors. And the nice thing about this system is you can change the threshold as your ability to deliver care changes. Now, we haven't yet developed something like that nationally for neurosurgery specifically, but perhaps this is a role for organized neurosurgery uh, to step in and really spearhead uh, a priority like this. And where this becomes important is because we're theorizing that there is a pent-up demand for these postponed surgical cases that may be quite significant, but this is frankly unclear. And we are for the first time gonna realize that in addition to prioritizing just neurosurgical cases, in each of our hospitals, we're actually gonna to have to work within specialty prioritization as well, right? Cancer patients and cardiac patients may or probably will need to go before our um, laminectomies and less urgent cranial cases. And the question is gonna be, what are gonna be the implications for this block time? And so that's where I think if we objectively as a group start uh, figuring out how a good triage process, we can then speak to individual hospital leaderships and our other departments uh, and work within our hospital system. Hospitals really need to develop a specific strategy for phasing in the operating room. I think it's unlikely we're gonna go from doing very few elective cases to being back at 100%. It's clearly gonna be an incremental increase with an eye on a whole bunch of things that we probably take for granted. Supply chain, inpatient beds, PPE availability, and then again, localization and co-localization of COVID and non-COVID patients in your hospital. Need to establish priorities for inpatients versus outpatients. And then we need to figure out the availability of redeployed or furloughed OR staff. Fortunately, at our center, this is less of an issue, but I think if you look at everything in the lay press, this may be a very major issue that as a group, we cannot overlook. There may just not be enough uh, employees left in certain sectors in our hospital. This is from just a couple of days ago in Politico that healthcare workers, although they may be recession proof, um, they may very well not be pandemic proof. Uh, my understanding is that thousands, tens of thousands of healthcare workers across the country have actually been laid off in hospitals that no longer uh, can uh, survive in, in this financially testing time. So 
I think for each of us uh, at our institutions, we need to look into um, this chain of uh, essential personnel. And then on the outpatient side, certainly looking at what staffing you have in place, what social, social distancing protocols we're gonna put into our clinics. We certainly can't see the same volume of patients uh, as long as social distancing is still uh, the law of the, the state. Um, you know, and patients probably are also not gonna feel comfortable with that arrangement. Uh, as a group, closer evaluations of H&Ps, uh, the 30-day H&P that many of us will just sign. I think we need to look closer at new symptoms and figure out whether patients need to be retested, perhaps the day of the surgery again. Greater focus on advanced directives with old, older and fragile patients or frail patients. Um, clear understanding and discussion about disposition. Are patients going home for after elective surgery? Are we expecting them to go to rehab or nursing homes? Nursing homes, as we know, have been really the source of a lot of the mortality. And frankly, are our rehab institutions, are they prepared to accept our patients? Um, and uh, how are we gonna treat our COVID and non-COVID uh, patients differently? So we certainly can't assume that our old practice routines are gonna fall right back into place. Now, the big unanswered question, and I'll, I'll finish with this, is we are assuming that there is a pent up demand for elective surgeries, but the question is, will patients come? Um, in our own stroke experience, and I think it has varied in the country. I know at Jefferson, Sinai, and at our shop, we actually have seen an increase in stroke volume. But the more I've certainly read about it, uh, it seems though that the national trend is that most hospitals are have seen a plummeting volume, for example, in emergency cases like strokes. And so I suspect that the increases we've seen at some of our larger quaternary centers may be more reflective of the fact that our surrounding hospitals no longer can provide these basic services or these high level services and these patients are now just being rerouted to us. But stroke volume has, has taken a hit and that's not, uh, and that isn't just in neuro. Uh, certainly my cardiac colleagues tell me the same has occurred in acute cardiac events. So if patients aren't coming for acute events such as this, it's gonna take some re significant re-messaging to patients to make them feel comfortable with elective surgery again. We, we have to overcome our safety concerns and distrust. So in conclusion, uh, it's important for all of us, I think, to understand local conditions at, in our counties and our hospitals. Facility-specific plans are very important to a successful transition. I think you, we all need to be prepared to approach our elective practices in the context of other services and regional factors. And like we've done here, I, I think it's important for all of us to establish governance committees really right now, whether it's in your practice or your hospital, to start navigating these uh, many critical issues that we're all kind of interlinked on across the hospital. So with that, uh, thank you uh, very much. And I think we will try to save the questions for both Dr. Sharon and I until the end. And then uh, I'm going to now defer to Dr. Nanda, who's gonna speak to us now about the organized, the efforts that organized neurosurgery uh, has taken after COVID-19. Dr. Nanda. Anil, uh, I want to, I have a slide to introduce Anil first, if that's okay. Look, you should skip it. Don't worry. This is, you know, this is a crisis time. We don't need ego. <laughs> so let's skip it. You know, like it's the old New Yorker line, you know, you pay $2 in the subway, no matter who you are. So uh, thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you, Char, for organizing. Thank you, Josh. And, you know, you have over 100 people. So thank you for organizing all this. And I think, you know, we would be remiss in not recognizing all the frontline workers that have put their lives on the line. Uh, you know, I, as a neurosurgeon, I don't think I've felt more useless in a certain sense, you know, because... It's the pulmonologist, the intensivist, it's the housekeeping that comes in and cleans the rooms that have put their lives on the line, and especially nurses that have spent so much time on the front line. So I really would recognize all of them. Can you see my screen right now? Everybody see that? Yes, it's good. Okay, good. So thank you again for these global uh, telerounds. Uh, let me see. Um, one second. I have to move my screen. So we all know the numbers, the flattening of the curve, and I'll move quickly because we're a little short on time, but I think we realize it's flattening and it's better. 
And again, I want to take a minute here. We've lost people. And, you know, Jim Goodrich was a dear friend of all of neurosurgery, a great leader. So we, you know, we, it's a time to pay respects to him. Uh, Dr. Vinaktu was the first female neurosurgeon in Indonesia. We lost her. And then Lou Ziming died in Wuhan itself. He was director of neurosurgery. And I think the healthcare count is now in the thousands in terms of mortality. So I think we recognize everybody's uh, sacrifice and we, uh, we sort of look up, you know, look to that. Now, in terms of New Jersey, we've, you know, we didn't think we'd be that badly hit, but we've really had with the same, if, if we look at it as a country, we'd be in the top 15. So the number of cases now are close to almost 100,000 or close to 5,000 deaths. So we've been on the front lines, not as bad as New York, but it's fairly serious and concerning. Uh, and I think social distancing has become the norm. I mean, I think in terms of teleradiology, telemedicine, all this stuff, uh, this is where we're going. And this was, I actually had this slide before Peggy Noonan put it in the Wall Street Journal. So this was for a happy Easter and a happy Passover. Uh, this is where our, our meetings are gonna look like from organized neurosurgery. Uh, I think this is public health issue. So I think it's important to talk about this, John Snow, uh, you know, they used to think cholera was caused by miasma, but he tracked it down to the pump. And I think this is a major public health issue that all neurosurgeons need to be aware of. And I think when you look at these mortality charts, this is the 200th anniversary of Florence Nightingale's birth. And she really came up with the pie chart and showed mortality in the Crimean hospitals, uh, something that we're seeing on a daily basis now across the globe. So again, the timeline, uh, this is Governor Murphy in the downline. You know, I think all of us were like, oh yeah, it's gonna be okay. And perhaps we weren't as prepared as neurosurgeons as we should have been. At least I can tell you that I was perhaps laissez-faire on this and say, yeah, you know, it's not gonna be that bad. And, you know, perhaps we should have been taken the warning signs much more seriously. Uh, just to give you the date lines, most of you know, March 1st, March 13th. And, you know, who would have thought that a month later that the whole world had changed? Uh, this is Chris Shaffrey's message from the ANS and with Steve Kalkanis. I think organized neurosurgery took this very seriously. The messaging was out there right away. Uh, there's no treatment, no vaccine. And it was great to see all, all sort of societies come together and say, listen, I mean, they canceled the ANS. It was a big meeting. The Orthopedic Society canceled their meeting. So there was massive cancellations and they came up with recommendations, uh, what we're gonna do, practice management, additional resources, all that was put together. Uh, now both societies have really stepped up on giving us webinars much like this. And I think this has happened on a local level, a state level and a national level. So the uh, ANS has a bunch of webinars. Uh, they had one on ICU management, how to, how to triage surgical cases, uh, we're going to do one on re-emergence strategy, resident management. I think we're doing one uh, next Tuesday on our triage cases. So these are serious issues that I think at a time like this, communication is so important. The word there, we spread the word. And as leaders in organized neurosurgery, we can't take this lightly. And we have to reassure the residents in terms of the educational process. And the CNS has done a great job. In fact, our program directors introduce this to all the residents that you should have, you know, go for these grand rounds of endoscopic surgery, optimizing care. And then this is sort of the onslaught of this. You know, our meetings were like a community gathering, you know, you uh, like going to church or going to temple or synagogue, you know, this is where everybody got. It was our form of disseminating knowledge. It was what's happening. It was sort of the medical industrial complex. You could look at million dollar machines, feel good about what was happening in the field. So as you realize the ANS got canceled, uh, the SNS, which is the Senior Society in Philadelphia, uh, which was gonna be a great meeting, Sean Grady was uh, you know, highlighting Penn, so that got canceled. Uh, the World Skull Base meeting in Brazil got canceled. And I think the Academy is gonna get canceled as well. So th there's a big onslaught of these, our global neurosurgery meeting, we moved to September. So it's, it's not good. I mean, I think it's disappointing, uh, but you, you know, safety is our number one concern. We didn't want to jeopardize anybody. Uh, and I thought that was the right decision to take. It was very painful, uh, but it was something that was sort of not avoidable at all. 
So what is the economic impact? I think in terms of organized neurosurgery, you look at this, but this is the Dow market. I mean, uh, it, it's, you know, there's trillions of dollars lost and there's a ripple effect in the economy. I mean, yesterday's Wall Street Journal said oil is going negative now. So people will pay you money to take the oil. Who would have thought that would happen a month ago? Uh, and I think the economic ripple effect is enormous. So this was in the Wall Street Journal and New York hospitals are losing a billion, uh, you know, over a billion. I think uh, Columbia is losing 400 million a month. I can tell you Rutgers has lost, it's going to lose 200 million, you know, and I think there's going to be big economic ripple effect because you can't sustain a system. There's no revenue coming in. And some of these systems, the margin was thin. It was sort of razor thin. So there's hiring freezes. Uh, you worry about the educational caseload for residents. They're not gonna be operating as much. And Ash covered that very well. And then how will we have future travel? Is this the new norm? Will it take four years to get a vaccine? Uh, will we not be having as many meetings as we had? And then how do we fill that void of education? I think organized neurosurgery looks at this very seriously as to listen, we are gonna make this better and we're gonna have webinars like this. Uh, and sort of try and make and flat, you know, make it uh, sort of flatten the educational curve. Uh, I'll tell you, in terms of recruitment, uh, at least in our, we're doing everything by WebEx. You know, I actually have WebEx sites. I mean, I'm doing WebExes from seven in the morning to five in the evening. Uh, but I also feel that this is sometimes a better way to go. Uh, you know, and I think the paradigm is going to shift. I mean. Uh, you know, these global events happen like September 11th and, you know, TSA agents, they, we didn't know what a TSA agent was before September 11th. And I think there's going to be a massive paradigm shift in terms of what our expectations are and how things will change. Uh, this was an editorial about banning the handshake, which was from JAMA, like in 2014, it was like years ago. And, you know, we, I wonder if the cultural norms, we perhaps will never shake hands again in a clinical setting. So something to just think about. Uh, we have done this at, in the, in the uh, Rutgers system. We have done meetings on WebExes. And this is, I can tell you that I feel the, the response is much better. This is our endovascular Kendall uh, giving us a great talk. And I feel that the response from residents is much better. We have, you can see some of our residents have got masks on. Uh, it used to be we'd do an editorial meeting and we'd have, you know, 15, 20. Now we have 30, 40 people. Uh, we initiated a project 100 during COVID that everybody should be writing papers. And we have like 100 research projects we're going to look at. Uh, and our m, m So the educational system has worked well. And I think there's lessons for that. This is what we did, sort of a project 100. Declan Boyson's our research person. And hi, soon they all put their research topics together with collaborators. And we made that happen. I think it's important to remember what we can learn from these disasters. What can we make better? So I lived through Katrina. You know, Katrina was a failure in terms of managing things on a local level, a state level, and a federal level. You could argue COVID was a disaster on a Chinese national level, on the WHO level, on our level. And I think it's like complications. You have to be really honest about it. Uh, the line they used in Katrina was the truth defied imagination. And I never thought I'd use that term again, but really this event, the truth has defined uh, imagination. And I think Don DeLulu had this beautiful line after, uh, after JFK was assassinated. He said, what has, become, what has become unraveled since that afternoon in Dallas is the sense of a coherent reality most of us share. We seem from that moment to have entered a world of randomness and ambiguity. I think this happened to us after September 11th. It happened after Kennedy's assassination. And I think it'll happen after this. We are going through a very traumatic time. And, you know, our healing is going to be different. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be, it's going to be an uphill task. It's not going to be May 15th, we're going to be normal and we're going to be doing 100 cases. I mean, I think, Joshua, looking at your case number, I'm, I respect you guys. Our numbers just collapsed. We were not doing anything urgent and our stroke numbers dropped. I mean, Goro Gupta, we were talking about our numbers in New Brunswick. They were getting six to 10 strokes a week and they were down to one stroke. So a lot of people have died in terms of collateral damage. The heart attack hasn't come in. You don't know what happened to that patient. 
a stroke patient hasn't come in. So a lot of stuff has happened, but I would sort of end with this insufferable optimism. And uh, Seamus Haney, the great poet, said, if we winter this one out, we can summer anywhere. And, you know, I think our heart bleeds for New York, for the country, and for the world. These are trying times for all of us. And whether you're in organized neurosurgery or departmental neurosurgery or a community hospital, I think it behooves all of us, whether we are neurosurgeons, whether we are residents, we're healthcare, bring out our best to sort of have a kinder, nobler, person out there to help everybody out. And this was, uh, uh, this was a slide from the Wall Street Journal that I just love. This was um, a rainbow over New York City and uh, it extended from the World Trade Center all the way to uh, being said, well, extended into New Jersey because I showed them this slide. Uh, but I think this is, uh, there is hope. I mean, after all that we've been through, we will emerge stronger. And as Nietzsche said, that which does not kill us only makes us stronger. So I think we'll emerge better. Organized neurosurgery will emerge better. Neurosurgery residents will have emerge better. And hopefully we are kinder, nobler professionals that are empathetic. We're empathetic to housekeeping that comes and cleans the place, to nurses, to respiratory therapists, to that whole team. You know, it takes a, a neurosurgical village or a village to make a difference. So. Thank you so much again for this opportunity. Thank you, Josh, for organizing all this. Thank you, Chirag and Ash. And I think we're open for questions, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Nanda. Um, so yeah, I mean, with that, I think we're definitely open for questions. Uh, first off, if uh, any of the listeners on this webinar have questions, please do share them with us and we will try to get to them uh, as, um, as we can. We have uh, roughly uh, 30 minutes or so left for them. So we're gonna move into the Q&A uh, portion of our discussion. And for that, we actually have a very uh, broad panel uh, <clears throat> the, from the Sinai group, certainly Dr. Bederson, uh, Dr. Post, um, Drs. Mako and Srivastava, who are both uh, respectively the uh, program directors and associate program directors. Uh, Constantine uh, Hagiopanis, who's the site director at Mount Sinai at uh, Union Square. Um, and uh, Mike Shoulder, who's supposed to be joining us around eight o'clock, program director and vice chair at the Northwell Institute. I'm here. Uh, oh, there you are. Okay, perfect. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, Peter Morgenstein and uh, Chris Kellner, who are both uh, instrumental in my uh, from my understanding in uh, the educational mission of the Sinai Residency. And Chris has been fantastic uh, for setting all of this stuff up behind the scenes. I think a lot of the credit actually goes to him. Uh, so with that, maybe I will uh, open with uh, a couple of questions and we can start uh, backwards with Dr. Nanda. Some of the things that you mentioned regarding uh, national uh, our national societies and the initiatives. You know, I was reading that both the CNS and AANS have jointly petitioned Congress for relief of neurosurgical practices and specifically, I think, not necessarily our hospital-based practice, but I suspect probably larger and smaller private practices. Um, either, uh, you know, could either you or Dr. Sharan, who's past CNS president, maybe either of you guys can comment on your understanding of this? So I know that Katie Rieker works tirelessly for both CNS and AANS, and she is working for some relief package. I think for smaller practices, that'll definitely happen. They're not going to be that sympathetic, say, to Rutgers University or, you know, Mount Sinai healthcare system. These are billion dollar systems and they're like, you know, so I, I don't know where that'll lead. I think, but I'm cautiously optimistic. Ash, I don't know if you may want to chime in on that too. Yeah, so uh, I would hope at least that systems like Rutgers and Sinai and others, uh, you know, if need be, uh, that they, there's some opportunity uh, for, uh, you know, compensation, at least for a lot of some of the losses that have taken place. I agree that they're multi-billion dollar systems, but they're also safety net hospitals in uh, each of our uh, respective uh, locations. So, um, uh, you know, um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Shoulder, Dr. Sharon, perhaps, you know, from a program director perspective, you guys can comment on how you think this might durably change your respective residencies. Um, I mean, starting just with, let's say the teleeducation piece, how effective has it been? Um, is it ready to go prime time? Is it going to replace face-to-face -face meetings as Dr. Nanda suggested? Well, it's going within to your department. 
it's going to replace some of them because yeah. the, the attendance at our team's base meetings has definitely been higher than the in-person meetings. So our grand rounds, tumor board, and we have a Friday morning conference that alternates between different topics. Uh, the attendance has been much better, including from people from the uh, so-called peripheral hospitals, if you will. And since everything is a network nowadays, there's a desire to have your faculty and, and uh, mid-level providers from other centers within the system join in. And that's actually now a reality and it's going to be one. I don't think it will completely replace nor should it completely replace in-person meetings. I'm, and I'm talking about only within the department. Uh, well, other structural changes that will happen, I think our collective desire, I mean, everyone on this on this meeting and everywhere else wants most of the neurosurgery business of our daily activity to go back to the way it was. We want to do as much surgery and related procedures as we can and see as many patients as we can and bring in new technology and innovate in various ways that we still want to do. Uh, so I don't think that structurally that will change. And just like uh, Anil commented, it, it, it is striking that the number of emergencies has dropped so precipitously. And it's not just the neurosurgery. There was a New York Times story last week about the number of cardiac emergencies that, that have plummeted. But that's all going to come back because people are going to want to get their care. So I think that our surgical volumes are going to recover, whether that's going to be in weeks or months or however many months that's going to happen. So I don't think that part of residency training is going to change or we should be concerned about that, but we should, we should not lose the, the opportunity to make something out of this crisis and certainly teleeducation is a big part of that. Um, one thing I think I'm going to add to this, uh, Chirag, is that like what you're doing today is fantastic. So one thing that it's opening the borders for is that now we can do the institution collaboration. Yeah. And, and I think the, the barrier to that has become zero. You know, there's no barrier for me to come and spend some time with you guys. And, and I learned a phenomenal uh, from your amount of from your presentation. So the second thing is that I, I think that there's been a phenomenal redundancy of effort. Like we don't have to make every anatomy slide again. We go to neurosurgery Atlas and Aaron Cohen-Gadal has done a phenomenal job of that, right? If your institution is a little bit more about quality improvement, then we come to you and share that knowledge. So I, I don't think we've done a good job about this collective knowledge sharing. And, and I think that's where some of these innovations will come out very shortly in residency education when it comes to operative nuances. You know, in our program, I alluded that there's six guys who do things subtly different. And in your program, there's probably 12 guys who do things, you know, somewhat different. And, and so that part of the education will be molded a little bit in together once we figure out, you know, how to get those right discussions. The third thing that I, which I, I think Mike alluded to is that, uh, you know, it shouldn't replace the in-person conference because, you know, the reality is right now we have 121 people on this call and it's very hard for everybody to be so engaged. And so I don't know in Zoom, are we going to have little subgroups and, little chat rooms on the side where people can actually have those conversations. I, I, I see some questions are starting to come up and I, I don't think we've become culturally attuned to that yet, but I actually think that that will also grow uh, in the future. You know, it's, it's uh, I, I'm looking at everybody on the screen where we're somewhat older probably um, as a group, but I, I think people will become much more comfortable in having their side conversations and opening up little groups. And, and so I think it is gonna transform tremendously. And it, the great thing is now that we have this tool, it's going to be hard for my faculty not to show up at these meetings because I know they can. So I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, no, I, 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 I'd agree with you. I mean, I think what we've found is that there are certain conferences that lend themselves very well to this format. You know, the working conferences have been, you know, particularly high yield. Uh, and then there are others that uh, it, it's still not quite the ideal format. <clears throat> One of the other questions that just came in for, the program directors here is um, in terms of recruitment uh, and for upcoming graduates. 
So, you know, just last week, I actually had the opportunity to interview fellows for our fellowship. And for the first time, we did this uh, entirely over WebEx. Uh, we had, you know, 25 some odd candidates, and I was able to sequentially give them a time, uh, interview them, and, you know, whittle those candidates down to two or three that we're going to hopefully invite on campus. Um, do, do any of you, or even the chairs that are on this call, do you guys see a potential impact on how we interview residents coming from this? Because there always has been this discussion about the massive burden, financial burden and time burden that the residency interview process requires. Is there some triage process as a community that we can all potentially agree on? Doc Dr. Betterson. Uh, Thanks, Shrug, and I really appreciate uh, your stepping up today. I hope we can continue this format and move the organization around the country uh, just, just as we're doing today. Uh, so thanks for doing that. Also, I wanted to thank Dr. Nanda. That was a wonderful presentation. Uh, I love the way that you draw on so much of your, your education to enhance the, your, your talks. Uh, we're, we're actively recruiting now for both attendings and residents and fellows. Uh, the recruitment process is not so difficult. What's difficult is the business plan because our business plans are all based on projecting a ramp up. You know, you, you have a perceived need for, uh, this I'm talking about attendings now. You have a perceived need, a, a spot to fill, uh, and you attach projections with numbers and growth to that and start dates and commitments for both salary support and research seed. And what I'm having a little trouble doing now is being as accurate as I can be because I'm held to those budgets and someone's not gonna move from across the country unless there's a fairly strong commitment that I will be able to meet. Uh, so right now I'm, for my attending recruitments, I'm projecting an October 1st start date for new graduates. Uh, and both my institution and the recruits seem to be fairly comfortable with that. Uh, and these are for fresh graduates who are not gonna be you know, necessarily transferring a practice, that sort of thing. Um, I think interviewing residents over Zoom or WebEx could work just fine. I would be very happy doing that. And I'd be interested in, in other people's opinion on this. And Neil, what do you think? So, you know, Dan Barrow for the Senior Society did a really thoughtful study on this to show that the residents are getting, the med students are getting hammered financially. Okay, they crisscross the country. And I think this would be a great disruptive innovation secondary to COVID. Maybe we should be going to WebExes for all interviews. I can tell you that we have saved a lot of money because we've done first interview, you start bring somebody, take them for dinner, usual stuff. Now it's like six WebExes, you're done, your letters come in. So the second visit is when you come in and visit the actual place. So we've eliminated one step, which is very cost effective. But I think to, to sort of extrapolate that, I say we should talk to the senior society and organize neurosurgery. We could really cut down costs for a segment that really, it makes an economic difference. You know what I mean? If you're gonna spend $10,000 traveling around the country and in a certain level, I think a WebEx interview is as effective as in person. You don't have to travel, it's easier, 15 minutes, you're done. So I personally think whether it's WebEx or Zoom, this is gonna be the future. Uh, and I think it'll flatten the world. I mean, what you did today with over a hundred people, tomorrow you could do globally with a thousand people. Uh, so I think that's the way we need to go. And people need this education. People are scared, you know, people are scared across the globe. What's this gonna happen? How is this gonna affect their practices? And I think for people like you, Josh, that have been on the front of all this, you have to project a symbol of hope that you lived through this, you survived it. And with the grace of God, all of us are gonna do well. Sometimes, I mean, you look at the New York Times, they're saying people are having four times as much nightmares as they did before. It's a very sort of, on a very simplistic level, it's affected people's lives in a way that, you know, a subdural wouldn't. 
And so I think we need to be more empathetic. We need to be kind. We probably need to reach out on a global level. Thank you, Sharag. I wonder if I, you would allow me to comment on the ramp up. Yes, please. Uh, so I see that there are two groups of patients that we have right now. Uh, one group is the pent up disease, uh, slowly growing tumors that are causing visual loss, uh, newly diagnosed lesions that are causing neurological disorders, uh, herniated discs causing spinal cord compression, intractable pain, things that we don't normally postpone. Uh, you know, one of the many things that we will see is that uh, we are, we've now switched to a wait and see management paradigm for things that we would have previously operated on more, more urgently. So we are developing a cold COVID pathway. Uh, we've been, we, we're going to be rolling this out next week. We have a faculty meeting on Friday in which we're going to go through the criteria. And the way to balance, in my view, the way to balance uh, the selection of cases is to first stratify the COVID risk. So we know what the risk factors for patients are vis-a-vis -vis COVID. And that's going to be a balance against surgery. And that will be balanced against the need for surgery. Uh, for example, the neurological deficit, the progressive uh, disabling uh, myelopathy, that sort of thing. And I will review those cases. We're going to publish these criteria system-wide. We've done away with all block time, so it's all going to be open time. Uh, and we will uh, for, first screen those cases for eligibility. Once they're screened, they'll go into an open booking uh, methodology. We are going to keep open one OR for the emergencies that have continued to flow. And I do want to uh, talk a little bit about, about that uh, if there's time. Uh, and we also are going to have what we call a cold COVID pathway. This is really meant for messaging to the patients because the other bigger group and the one that's more vital to our survival as a field uh, and department are the patients who are home with disease who just don't want to come in. Uh, you know, it's great that Mount Sinai has been on the front lines as a COVID treatment place. But if you're a patient with a tumor, uh, maybe you're going to think about going to a place that wasn't so great at treating COVID, right? Uh, because you don't want to expose yourself. And this is an absolutely real and vital issue. Uh, we know that patients, uh, and Jay, Jay Mako, if you're on, you may want to comment on this. We know that stroke patients are having their strokes at home and not coming in and dying or you know not getting their stroke treated because of this fear. So uh, equal as the cold COVID pathway and developing our strategies to provide a pathway through our hospital system without exposure to COVID units is messaging. And we're working on a whole uh, communication strategy to get out there to message to our patients that we care about this and what our processes are. Yeah, and Josh, that messaging piece, I think, uh, as you mentioned, cannot be overlooked because that is really gonna be probably their rate limiting step in the end once everything within the hospital is up and running. That's gonna be what's gonna drive the return of our elective practices. Um, so that's a fantastic initiative. I mean, what I was, uh, alluding to in my talk is I think some pieces of that are broadly applicable to your institution, my institution, Anil, Mike's, um, and perhaps there's a way as we're sharing information here in a very different way, perhaps there's a way for us to kind of nationalize strategies on how neurosurgical departments can really help start triaging this. Uh, because some of these things are facility specific, but a lot of it I, I don't think necessarily needs to be uh, as well. Um, doc, Dr. Shoulder, well, how are you guys approaching things at, at your shop uh, in the next uh, couple of weeks? Well, well, since there's no official reopening yet, it's all in the discussion and theoretical stage. And we've started 
to talk about it in the ways that Josh was outlining. One thing we don't have to deal with is the change from block to communal time since we haven't had block times here, a, a major sore point ever since I got here, but now I guess that uh, we could treat it as moot. So we uh, are working on sort of a, a ladder of prioritizing cases, patients who've been waiting for surgery or new patients who will come in and uh, giving them a score as to who gets priority and we will plan on arranging elective surgery in that way and working in tandem with the nursing office and the hospital administration in terms of making sure that the staffing is back to the pre shutdown levels because it certainly is not now and we couldn't accommodate obviously a full elective schedule today and so we'll have to do that hand in hand uh, but it, it it is all in the talking stage right now there is no date set for any of that at this point but I think we can assume safely that by July 1st, we will be up and running reasonably close to a normal operative schedule. Jay, are you on the phone? Are you able to uh, comment on the observations around stroke? Jay, I think you're on mute. Hold on. Is that better? Yep. Okay, sorry about that. Um, well, I, stroke's been very interesting. When New York City was on its peak and, and we were seeing the surge really happen right around the time that uh, they started closing schools, closing businesses, all the rest. Over those next three weeks, we saw 45 elbows, which is crazy. And I think it was because of the epidemic nature of it and that it's a prothrombotic disease the the social distancing and the staying at home has clearly changed that so we're we're not we're now back to sort of normal levels if anything slightly down because people who are having these diseases aren't coming in uh you know the new york times uh ran a piece where four times as many people are being found dead at home than normal by ems you know they're getting calls where they arrive and they're calling them all cardiac arrest but uh, I, you know, I wonder how many of these are subarachnoids or stroke or other things that we're just too afraid to call in. And we've documented a number of strokes where people uh, waited, even with quite profound uh, deficits, before calling the hospital because of that fear Dr. Betterson was talking about. Now we're seeing a different kind of emergency, which is these long-term COVID patients that have all had infarcts that are now all, all on anticoagulation because that's now become the standard for the patient population. So we're seeing a fair number of hemorrhages. Um, so, you know, the, it's the joys of vascular. You either have not enough blood or too much blood in the brain. And uh, we're seeing both sides of it with the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, so uh, Chris, I see that there's a, a hand raised. Are you able to, I'm not sure how to navigate that, if you can help me. Yep. I see a hand raised by Melvin Proskoff. Um, I'm going to allow you to speak. Okay, Melvin, if that hand was raised intentionally. Hey, hi, I'm Mel Proskoff up in New Hampshire. I got out of Mount Sinai in 1983, long time ago. What's the experience of everybody in terms of the clinic uh, activities using telemedicine at this time? And do you think it's going to keep going forward? And are people feeling that there's a lack of uh, valuable uh, hands-on capability, especially doing a neurologic exam remotely, you either having a caregiver or a parent or a child assisting the patient uh, or the patient trying to do the exam himself rather than you being in the room and actually touching and, and seeing what you want to see. Uh, Dr. Prostikov, that's a great question, actually. That was one of the things we were going to try to discuss in the seminar, and I think just for the sake of time, we've sort of limited the scope, but uh, I think variety of centers here have at least some garnering some experience on telehealth. For us, it's been uh, very much uh, something to push us uh, over the inertia, something for a year we've been talking about uh, in initiating, and this kind of made all of us uh, change our outpatient practices. Uh, we now have uh, pretty consistent telehealth office days, just like we would regular office hours. 
Um, patients actually seem to appreciate it. I mean, just, you know, given the current circumstances and then for certainly for the follow-ups for me, I found great feedback in my patients who no longer have to drive multiple hours sometimes to get here. Um, you know, I, Chris, I know has done a tremendous amount in, in telehealth and some of your initiatives. Chris, do you want to just briefly talk about that? Yeah. Um, you know, this, it's, it's been great to see the uh, patient adoption of telehealth. And it's something that I've actually been really trying to push patients towards for about a year, trying to get them to do telemedicine visits. If they're in rehab, have the family hold the phone and people really wanted to come into the office. And, um, and now I'm feeling now, now obviously they can't. And everyone, I think the patients and the staff agree that it's, things are working much more efficiently. And really most of the time we're, we're able to get a good exam and, and get the information we need that way. I'm sure some issues will come up over a large number of patients, but for the vast majority of patients, we're able to get the information we need through, uh, through a telemedicine exam. Chris, can you tell, uh, tell us a little bit about precision recovery? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So um, another telemedicine effort um, is, is called remote patient monitoring, and that's where you're giving a patient an app or a device and having them record information on a daily basis. So at Mount Sinai, we've rolled this project out for COVID patients. And so a COVID patient comes into the ED or they're getting discharged from the hospital. And we have them download an app and have a provider assigned to them and that's an advanced practice provider. And that advanced practice provider monitors the data that the patient is inputting on a daily basis. If the patient's high risk, we're actually giving them a pulse oximeter and they're adding that pulse oximetry data to their daily report. Um, and then we're following that. If we see any worsening in symptoms, we initiate a video call with that patient. And um, you know, as of last week, when I last reviewed the data, we had um, monitored 600 patients at home and we'd escalated care from the provider to an MD uh, 125 times. And, uh, we had sent 15 patients into the emergency room, uh, who were doing, having worsening symptoms at home and some worsening pulse ox data. Uh, and two of those, when they arrived to the emergency room were really in bad condition. Um, so, and, and it, it took us convincing them to, to get in there, uh, that really made the difference there. And I think well, part of that question also uh, is going to pertain to how CMS, you know, what their rules are going to be moving forward, right? Right now, they've gotten rid of HIPAA and, you know, there's now compensation for these telehealth uh, visits. But I suspect soon once this is all done, and certainly the reinitiation of HIPAA and moving to HIPAA compliant telehealth systems is going to be very important for all of us. Uh, and I, I do think, though, that the payment piece will remain with this. I, I, I think telehealth is, is with us for the long term. We're just gonna have to figure out where we're gonna employ it best. Greg, I just wanna comment. Yeah, please. Everyone has to understand that telemedicine, where you might call a patient or FaceTime or Skype them, but that's not telehealth and you'll get reimbursed at a much lower rate. This is in case anyone doesn't know this, like yeah. a third of the regular rate, but telemedicine is where you set up and a, a scheduled appointment with platforms that have been approved, and there you will get paid at close to the rate that CM, by CMS, uh, at least, uh, that they are used to uh, reimbursing for outpatient visits. So just uh, wanted to point that out. No, that's a, that's a great point, thank you. Um, so I think, Chris, we, we have what, like just a minute or two left, right, in our scheduled time? Yes. Okay, so with that, maybe I could just ask a, a couple of people on this call that obviously we're seeing the news that every industry has been turned upside down. Uh, most, most of them in negative ways, some of them in positive ways, I guess, if you're Amazon. Um, if you were to predict one thing long-term that you think is going to be permanently changed in neurosurgery, what, what, would, you, what would you pick as that item? Dr. Nanda. I think it's going to be telemedicine. I mean, I think we have adopted very early on this. This is going to be the future. It's going to flatten the world. I mean, you can get a second opinion from Uzbekistan uh, for a very low cost. So, I mean, I think that disruptive innovation will really spread very quickly. Uh, and I think we'll do more on WebEx or Zoom. I think that's going to be the one post-COVID contribution, much like TSA agents were for September 11th, yeah. Dr. Betterson? Uh, 
Um, I think you. Um, I think you're on mute. There you go. I don't know if our experience will be the same as others, um, but we've gone from a very proactive mode of operating at the right, what we thought was the right moment, to a conservative management mode. And we don't know the outcome of that yet. Uh, it's, it has potential for a significant change in the way we approach neurosurgical management because we may see that there are very good outcomes by postponing our decisions uh, to operate. So I think this is yet to be determined, but I'm interested to follow it. Costas, any last thoughts on this? Yeah, you know, I think the, the, the point made about increasing patient's confidence is really an important one. You know, yesterday I had a really uh, moving telemedicine medicine visit with a 30 year old with a deep uh, subcortical GBM who's just frightened and he needs surgery and we he's frightened at coming into the hospital knowing that our center is is really the center of the pandemic here in New York City. So I, I think these are some of the, the, the discussions today were excellent. I, I think everyone made some really nice points and I thank you guys all for that. But you know building up our patients confidence in us again I think is going to be really important in some of these sites where we have um, COVID prevalence really at an all-time high. And then uh, maybe lastly, Dr. Post, uh, with, with uh, all of your experiences and throughout your career, uh, any, any final perspectives on this? Um, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, I think it's been well touched upon by all of you. I'm a little bit removed from it, but I think telemedicine certainly is going to have a more significant uh, Part. Uh, I guess I'm a little old school. I still like face-to-face -face and reading people's reactions and making sure they can understand it, but that's probably from my lack of time on telemedicine yet. Um, certainly when you're seeing a face like this, you can read certain things and explain it and take the time to do it. And I think Josh is right. Uh, conservative medicine is going to have a, uh, um, I don't say a field day, but certainly something to be considered. There's a lot of things that we deal with where ultimate outcomes are not totally known. And in the areas that I work particularly, there are conservative approaches that one could do for months before needing to uh, definitively operate unless you have something like visual decline. So it is a new world. How we build patient confidence back, not in us, but in the system is going to be a major thing. And you've all touched upon that. And uh, I think it's just going to take time. Uh, we, we need to you know, press a button and be a year down the road rather than a month down the road. Everybody wants things to open you know, in a few weeks or a month to get the economy back and get out of the house and start to see people again. Um, but it's going to take time. This is something very different. Words up with